for our first session. Let's welcome Joanna Motoran. Assessment Solution Project Manager at the British Council. And Gemma Bellhaus, Test Product Quality Assurance Manager at the British Council. Welcome, Gemma. Welcome, Joanna. You can start now. Okay, well, thank you very much. And we've got our slides up, which is wonderful. Um, just a little bit more information about Gemma and myself. We work in a team in the British Council, which is called Global Assessments. Um, one of our responsibilities is looking after the APTIS test development and quality assurance. And we also work to um, modify APTIS for use in specific contexts. So that is really what we're talking about today is this idea that we can develop localized tests um, to professional standards to be used in particular contexts. And that's generally this idea that we're going to be talking about, which is the idea of localization. So thank you very much for joining us. And um, that's what we'll talk about today is this localization. Um, so where do we start? Um, the idea of localization is the idea that for a test, and this comes from Barry O'Sullivan's um, writing about language test localization, is that for a test to be used appropriately in a specific social or educational context, it must be shown to fit with the needs of that context. So as I mentioned before, the team Global Assessments has been working on a couple of projects, um, increasing, it seems, by the year, uh, where we've been creating local text tests that fit local contexts. Um, so we'll be talking about those projects today and talking about the models that we use to um, make sure that we're doing a, a professional and well-documented job of that localization. But before we, we get on with the discussion, um, I've said the word context, I think four or five times already uh, in all of about 60 seconds. Um, and what we found through our work in localization is that context is, is central to this notion of um, amending or, or modifying a test to fit local needs. Um, and what we found is that it's really helpful to adopt a Hallidayan model of context to work through the kinds of decisions that we have to make when we're, we're doing localizations. Uh, we'll talk about that in more detail later on, but just to start off with, when we're talking about context, we're talking about a model which is talking about the context of culture as being this sort of, um, Barry mentioned before, the, the context of use. So this, this larger context of culture um, where a test sits and, and a text sits. And there's also a context of situation um, for each um, test item. Um, and each text that we're talking about making modifications to. So hopefully that becomes clearer as we go along. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is two localized tests and three models that we've used to inform localization decisions uh, as we've developed those localized tests. The first one we're talking about today is the workplace literacy and numeracy test in Singapore which is a computer delivered English language and numeracy test. It's used to assist to assess proficiency in speaking, listening, reading, writing and numeracy in Singapore. And the tests were developed by the British Council. And I, I spent a lot of time on the test development myself. Um, but we worked in collaboration with the client, which was Skills Future Singapore, which is uh, a Singapore government agency and with the University of Innsbruck on the numeracy test. And the test scores are used by Singaporeans and some immigrant workers, um, people who come to try and access for future training um, and future development opportunities, but they come without formal qualifications. So perhaps they didn't finish high school for a number of reasons. So they can use these WPLN tests as proxies for high school qualifications so that they can access better opportunities. The second test we're going to talk about is Aptus American, which is um, 
is a variant of APTIS, which is our computer delivered test of English language proficiency. Um, and it was adapted for test takers who had studied American English. And it was originally created for a client in Colombia, uh, but it's available around the world now. As we're describing the decisions that we made in the localization of these tests, we'll be looking at these three different test development models. And the first one is the localization model. The second, the sociocognitive model, uh, which you've had some introduction to already this morning. And the third is the cyclical model of test development. So we shall jump on and try and have a look at these. The first one, uh, the localization model is um, we start out with the Aptus test, which is a very flexible test um, system of itself. Um, and it was designed to be flexible in that if a client comes to us and says, well, I only want a speaking test or I only want a speaking and listening test, it's very easy for us to adopt um, the way that we deliver the test and say, okay, that's fine. That's a level one location and, and we can be flexible in delivery. At the same time, when the tests were originally conceptualized, there's this idea that you could take this general um, English language proficiency test and make slight contextual modifications um, and have this lexical topical modification and have what we call a level two uh, localization. And that's the level of localization that we'll be talking about today about the um, Singapore WPLN and the Aptus American. At the same time, the model has a level three, a level four, a level five um, localization choices. And when we get to a level five localization choice, as you can see there, that is actually a new test. And so part of the localization for the Singapore solution was to develop a numeracy test for the client. Um, so that falls under this level five localization. Um, so what do we mean when we, we talk about a level two localization and what kind of decisions are we making to to change the test from, you know, we're saying at level one, it's it's a very general, international, um, adaptable kind of test. And then we're moving it to a specific context of use at a level two. So what kind of decisions do we make um, when we're going to do that? In the Singapore model, um, one of the, the major tasks for that was to review the content of the listening item bank. Um, we went into the recording studio and re-recorded all of the items with Singapore voice talent. So the original Aptus uses um, voice talent sourced in the United Kingdom, um, all of it being voices that you're likely to hear on the streets, as it were, in the United Kingdom. But the Singapore client was very keen for us to um, re-record using Singaporean voice talent and a variety of Singaporean voices. So that was the first step was to go and, and re-record. But while we were re-recording, we were also paying attention to things that would sound out of place in uh, a Singaporean accent. So the most obvious things are things like unit you know, of measurement. Um, in one listening item where people are talking about buying and selling used cars, uh, the price is quoted in pounds. In Singapore, they don't use pounds, they use dollars. So the first move there is to say, well, it's no longer pounds, it's now dollars. Um, but while we were recording it, it became really obvious that actually talking about the price of a secondhand car in Singapore by only changing it from pounds to dollars was nonsensical. Um, and the, the illustration here is to show you that a, a car that if you want to purchase it secondhand in the UK, it's going to cost you about seven and a half thousand pounds, which is about twelve and a half thousand Singapore dollars. The same car, same model, about the same age, if you want to buy it in Singapore, will cost you maybe four times as much. Um, actually, my maths is really bad. They're five times as much. So 
it's just an example of how when we're making localization decisions, we're not only thinking about units of measurement and really obvious um, lexical items, we also need to think about does this particular item, does this particular text make sense in the new context? There was another example um, that we we hit where um, we had a candidate, sorry, we had a, a voice actor talking about taking a gap year, um, which, you know, is, is a lovely notion where in between high school and university, you go off and explore the world and, and become a grown up. Um, in the original, it was a male voice talking about this. And when we went into the recording studio, we realized that a Singaporean male voice actor can't talk about a gap year because a Singaporean male high school graduate goes to national service um, for the next two years and um, is definitely not going on a gap year. So something that we looked at there was thinking about, well, actually a male voice isn't going to be able to read the script, but we can change it to a female voice and it will make sense. So that was another kind of change that we needed to make. Um, while we were doing the development, and this is the, the level five localization, which was where we were uh, developing a completely new test with the University of Innsbruck for the numeracy, we learned some really interesting localization facts about mathematical notation, um, which were not obvious at all to us. In Singapore, when you're doing a Pythagoras question and drawing a right angled triangle, you need to use a little square mark in the right angle to show that it's a 90 degree angle. But in Germany and Austria, which was um, the education systems that these items were kind of being developed within the thinking of, uh, the notation is quite different. You can see there's a little semicircular um, notation with a dot in it. When we sent these items off for review with our, our local partner, they came back with big red circles around them and question marks going, what is this? This makes no sense at all. And so it's just another example of how the context of culture where the item sits has an impact on what kind of meaning there is um, and how we need to make these changes for the test to be fit for the local context. I'll hand over to um, Gemma now to talk about Aptus American in some detail. Thanks, Joanna. Okay, so uh, for the second localization project, I'm just gonna talk through some of the examples of the changes we made to the test content. Uh, this was also based on Aptus General, just uh, as in the WPLN project that Joanna managed. So as this project was a test for South America, it was named Aptus American. And as you can imagine, this was a case of looking at the British language and adapting it for a purely American context. I treated each test item as a text and reviewed them to determine if anything needed to be amended. And this is a project that I managed, I carried out myself, as you might pick up from my accent. I've spent a lot of time in the US as well as the UK. Uh, so I consider myself bilingual on that count. But this was not a one person project at all. We also took contributions from multiple American recording studio informants, similar to the Singaporean voice talent. And we I referred to many referential resources, dictionaries, um, online resources, and we also carried out an expert test panel review. So let's take a close look at this table here on the slide. The Aptus skills or components are in the top light blue row across the top. And at the left in the light blue column, you can see the categories field, tenor, and mode. And all the amends to the test were separated into these three categories. For the initial review and to analyze the changes, the theory of a context of situation, um, as Joanna has just been talking about, and these three categories came from systemic functional linguistics. Um, but what do these categories actually refer to? What do they mean? So for field, this refers to the content, um, basically the, the idea of the content, the vocabulary generally. So, so phone number, a phone number can change from uh, British to American. It can 
be a simple word like holiday to vacation. Um, for the purposes of this localization project in particular, the field category was the most e easy to recognize. Um, simply translation, really. And for tenor, this refers to the change of language due to the social relationship of the speaker to the reader or listener. So the tenor can refer to social classes within contexts, um, which can definitely arise between American and British Englishes. Um, British English vocabulary is often understood perfectly well in American contexts, but maybe just not used in the same way uh, or by the same people. So, for example, you wouldn't generally hear a 20-year-old American male say that his evening with his parents was quite lovely. Uh, and finally, for the category mode, this refers to the channel of communication and often the technical linguistic elements of the language um, come into account here. So this type of change could represent adapting a spoken text to become a written text. But for the purposes of this localization project um, and context, most of the changes were related to slight amendments to spelling and the occasional verb tense and also implementing the American accents and, and maybe a bit a slight, slightly different tone um, in some places for the speaking and listening recordings also falls under the mode category. So let's move on to the next uh, model. So this is the sociocognitive model of test development and the objective in using and implementing this model in localization projects is to just be sure that we are producing the quality local tests that achieve the overall aims of the stakeholders. So we were very interested in thinking carefully about the impact of the stakeholders on the test development and vice versa. What is the impact of the new test or an amended test in this case on all the stakeholders? So looking at this model in keeping with the two tests, the projects, um, keeping in mind this question, does this model work for all types of localization projects and why? And do all stakeholders need to be involved? Could this model be improve, improved or maybe only used in a limited way? So let's look at the first project, the, w, the Singapore WPLN test, um, and at the consequences and impact of the stakeholders on the test development and surrounding test materials. So for the test takers who hadn't used a computer before, they required training. Test development considered adapting the test, um, but then decided to go with a computer-based model still. So for the parents and caregivers who needed to support the test takers but didn't have a high level of English, we actually created a shorter simplified candidate guide. And for the teachers, there were special webinars um, and test familiarization sessions which were carried out by Joanna herself. And for the administration, there have been, there's been special needs and accommodations training for local staff on how to administer computer tests and how to resolve any technical issues. So then the other way, uh, considering the consequences and impact of the tests on the stakeholders, such as the test takers, the broader society and the policy makers, we replaced a test that had actually already been in use for about 15 years. And this new test still linked to the existing standards. In this way, the old test scores were so meaningful. We did do a standard setting to make sure that the test scores on the new assessment reflected the same framework. But there were effects. The effects of uh, the test takers and teachers getting used to the new test preparation and test familiarization materials. Um, the training providers modified their curriculum, which is evidence of impact as well. And as hoped, there has been a positive impact on teaching as the new WPLN test reflects the shift towards communicative testing. Now looking at the next example of American Aptis, or Aptis American, <laughs> interchangeable. Uh, firstly, the stakeholders impacting on the test. Well, the test takers wanted a test aligned to their learning, we assume. Um, the teachers also wanted a test aligned to their teaching, of course. Uh, to be consistent with the American language curriculum, it only made sense. Employers, in the region expected a test to represent American use of English. So this plays into face validity and also broader society, they're using American English. So um, it would only, you know, it, it only makes sense that a test should be reflecting the, the language that people are using in their everyday lives. 
So, of course, the consequences and impact of the test on the stakeholders. Well, the test takers have a nicer test taking experience. It's a more valid test. It's fit for purpose, just like with Barry's quote. Um, for the teachers, it supports their teaching. And for the employers, they're more likely to accept the score if the language reflects their current context. So let's move on to the third model. Back to you, Joanna. Thanks, Gemma. And I'm just really aware of time, so we might zzz through this um, first model of the model. This is a representation of the whole test development um, cycle that we go through when we're looking at a new test or um, looking at developing a new test. And so we're thinking about how does this cycle model of test development work when we're doing a localization. So if I jump to um, the uh, example of the WPLN, we can see uh, the dark blue um, ovals there. These are the ones that were appropriate from the original um, cyclical model uh, for the WPLN. But we can see that there's a few differences. Um, we didn't have a test panel review when we were looking at this localization because um, there'd been a contract already signed basically with the client. Uh, so we weren't making a decision about if we were going to go ahead or not with this project. It was all systems go. Uh, in terms of rater and item writer training, uh, we use our Aptus examiners to do the rating for the Singapore WPLN because the writing and the speaking are basically um, the same tasks as Aptus. So we didn't need to do any rater training for that, but we did need to do quite a lot of item writer training with the University of Innsbruck because we were developing a whole new test. So that was a whole heap of new items, new item specs and new item training, um, item writer training. Um, if we go around to revision of content and specifications, um, we had to add an extra step in there because we were working directly for a client who was very keen to review all new items. So that added a little bit of extra work in the, the localization there, but it was actually an excellent quality assurance stage um, and definitely helped with the localization because as I mentioned before, there were spe things specific to the Singaporean um, education system that we couldn't know. So having that extra level of review and uh, localization was was very good for the test development as as much as it meant a lot of work at the time. Um, for Aptus American, uh, it's slightly different because this is uh, an in-house localization. So we didn't have a specific client that we were sort of directly selling to. Um, so we also made a bit of a decision, uh, we call it a principled compromise, um, that we didn't need to conduct piloting or trialing or standard setting for the new items because essentially um, Gemma and the review team made sure that the, um, the essentials of the items stayed the same. Uh, so we, we haven't really um, done those three parts of the cyclical model. However, we are keeping a really close to eye on the monitoring data to make sure that the items are performing as we're expecting them to, um, even though there are these uh, changes in the pronunciation. It's actually flowing onto other thinking about um, what pronunciation and what voice actors we're using across Aptus, but that's probably not something I should talk about right now. Um, so, just to finish up very quickly, um, these three different models, how were they useful? Um, the localization model is really handy as a way of starting conversations with clients and talking about what kind of changes need to be made to tests. Obviously, um, doing this kind of work is expensive and time consuming. So it's a good way to start talking to clients and talking to test users about what really needs to be done. Um, and you know, talking about scope of projects, really. Uh, the other thing that we've managed to do here, and I think it's a really important step, is to improve our documentation at the localization model level. Um, so thinking about the context of culture and the context of situation helps us to systematize the decisions that we're making as we, we make those amendments. Um, 
In terms of the socio-cognitive model, uh, we say there we need to systematically review, reflect and record the consequences and impact of the stakeholders on the test and of the test on the stakeholders. We, we also need to think more, I think, about um, the system. And, and I think Barry helps us think about that a lot as well. Um, we can't think about a test as just sitting by itself. It sits within a system and there are obviously communication demands around it. Um, familiarization, training, and so on, um, that we need to add that step in um, and add that thinking. And that that goes on to the circular model of test development as well. We, there's probably a missing step in that localization when we do a localization, which is um, the development of support materials. Um, and there are also questions about how we deliver tests, but we can't really talk about that now. Um, thank you very much. And um, I wonder if we have any questions on the basis of that presentation. Uh, Louise, you're on mute. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much, Joanna and Gemma. We have a question here. Let me show you. It says, what suggestion do you have for test prototyping, piloting, field, and similar procedures in a small institution with a small number of students in developing local tests? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, i start this and one of the things that we did with the piloting for the numeracy test in Singapore, which was incredibly interesting, was just observing test takers taking the test. I mean, this was very early on um, and we had questions around, um, we had questions around the platform that we were using, um, around how candidates would engage with the platform, how they would behave on the platform, because we had some questions about um, test taker behaviour, where they might be trying to game the system a little bit, just sitting and watching people taking the test, looking at the steps they were going through as they were answering questions um, was really handy. So I think things like think aloud protocols um, while you're piloting uh, to really understand how candidates are engaging with different items um, is really useful and observation is really, really useful. Gemma, would you add anything there? No, I think that sums it up really well. It's a very good answer and I, I'm aware we're, we're running out of time as well. So. Okay, thank you. There are um, the last question is from Jose Luis. Uh, coming from the fact we create an in-house test done by professors, how do you suggest we can validate this test? <laughs> I'll let you jump on that one as well, Joanna. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gemma. Um, so this is an enormous, enormous question. And, um, well, validations are always about... Um, how are you using the scores and, and is it reasonable for you to use those scores to make the kinds of decisions you're going to make? Um, so I, th I think that's that's the first the first question you're going to to address. I, th I think it's certainly useful to think about Barry's um, alignment, the, the notion of systemic alignment. So making sure that the assessment is well aligned with the curriculum and the delivery uh, are all aligned. As Barry mentioned earlier, it's completely um, unfair and um, basically leads to a broken system if, if those um, pieces of the system are not in alignment. Um, uh, but but valid test validation is, is such an enormous thing. But the first question would be, are you making reasonable decisions based on the scores and, and is the assessment aligned 
with the delivery and the curriculum. All right. Thank you very much for your time. There are no more questions here. Uh, thank you for your time, for your uh, knowledge. Thank you, the audience, for your participation. Um, uh, it's time to finish this session. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks for having us.